All right. Hi, I'm Jessica O'Connor. I am with the Falmouth Public Library. Thank you for joining us uh, for tonight's lecture, The Science and History of Shipwrecks, Archaeology and Conservation with Marie Zahn. Marie is a Cape Cod native, is the director of the Brooks Academy Museum and A. Elmer Crawwell Decoy Bar Museum for the Harwich Historical Society, as well as serving as the administrator for the Historical Society of Old Yarmouth. Prior to this, she spent several years working on an early 18th century shipwreck as an archaeologist, conservator, and science education coordinator. Marie's work in science and archaeology has given her a unique perspective and appreciation for history. She believes that history is a continuous narrative and that it is of the utmost importance to make connections between the past and where we are today. Marie aims to make science open, inclusive, and accessible to anyone that is curious about the past, present, and future. So please, um, welcome Marie. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you so much for inviting me and for everyone who has signed in and joined us this evening. Um, I am an artifact uh, conservator and archaeologist, though I don't get to do too much hands-on work uh, these days. Um, but tonight I'm going to be taking you on a journey through the science and the history of shipwrecked artifacts. So we're going to be taking an overview at the science side of things first before we move into what I call the case studies. And we'll be able to take a look at some different sites that span the globe, as well as some pretty diverse time periods. And uh, my goal as you're seeing these images and looking at some of the artifacts that have survived is to think about why that is. And uh, we'll go over that in some uh, pretty uh, good detail. So you'll have a, a good setup when we start looking at our shipwreck site. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now so we can look at some images as I talk to you. Okay. So all historians learn about the past through primary sources. Now, these sources can be stories and documents written by people that lived throughout history, but we also learn from artifacts. Archaeologists such as myself study history and learn about the past through these artifacts. Now, what we mean by an artifact is an object that has been left behind by people from long ago. What these objects are made out of determines how they will survive over time, and that's where the conservation side comes in. A lot of objects don't become artifacts because they don't survive from the past to today. The artifacts that archaeologists find tell a narrative about the people that used these objects. Sometimes we end up only seeing part of the picture because we only have some of the artifacts. And it's our job to piece together the story using all of the resources that we have. When it comes to shipwrecks, archaeologists have a potential time capsule of the past it's a pretty safe assumption to, uh, to claim that most shipwrecks happen unintentionally. All of the objects on board, from the parts of the ships themselves to the cargo and personal items of the crew, sink together. So what you have is a single slice of history preserved in one place, a small moment in time captured unexpectedly. With other archaeological sites, those on land, like Stonehenge, for example, what survives into the present isn't necessarily what the site would have looked like or contained in the past. People populated and made use of this place, but eventually took their portable items and evidence of living there away. Like when you move from an old house into a new one. Future historians may be able to tell what the purpose of a building is through the arrangement of the rooms and those permanent fixtures, you know, like the walls and the doorways. But without any content, these historians wouldn't be able to tell anything about the people that lived there. Sites that gradually stop being used by our ancestors are different from something like Pompeii, which is what we're looking at here, which was preserved by tragedy in the middle of an otherwise unremarkable day. So this is a sort of uh, violent occurrence, in this case, a tornado and earthquake that trapped the city's inhabitants under layers of ash and rubble as well as preserving the buildings, artwork, and even food from almost 2,000 years ago. 
So an archaeological site like Pompeii is a lot more comparable to a shipwreck site than something like a ceremonial burial site would be. Uh, with a burial, what you have is this very intentional and deliberate placing of artifacts to hopefully survive for hundreds, if not thousands of years. So for something like this in a grave site, what we call grave goods are artifacts and remains that have been carefully constructed to tell a specific narrative about the person being buried. So if someone was buried with spheres, uh, armor, and chariots, we can probably infer that they might have been a prolific and well-respected hunter using these context clues. Now in the tombs of Egypt, historians can see carved and painted stories from a person's past, but whether those stories actually happened or are kind of elaborate fantasies and some post-mortem embellishments uh, requires a lot of analysis on the part of the archeologists and historians to figure out what actually happened in that person's life. But with shipwrecks, we frequently have to rely on interpreting an incomplete picture because evidence that was once there is no longer present. This process is where underwater archaeology differs from archaeology on land. Now, artifacts that have been on dry land from the time that they stopped being used by the people of the past to when they were uh, rediscovered by modern people don't undergo the same changes as artifacts that have been in the ocean. Uh, some of that, of course, is because on land, the places and the artifacts tend to stay in the same location. Um, although in many cases, you might have later generations of humans uh, settling atop these older cities. Uh, but pretty much everything stays where it is. Now with the shipwreck, you have the violence of the sinking itself, plus you've got tides, waves, currents, uh, and sea life scattering pieces of debris across the ocean floor. Now, all of that is in addition to human interference, like with industrial fishing, shipping routes, oil pipelines, and in some cases, even wartime activities. But really the biggest difference between an archeological site on land or in the water is of course, the chemistry of the water itself. Now, underwater or maritime archeology span uh, combine history with a lot of science. There are a lot of factors that determine which artifacts survive and which ones do not. And first among them is the substance that that object itself is made out of. The second factor is what environment they're in. And pretty much all of that is your pure science. Now, while archeology span is traditionally thought of as a historical pursuit, a big part of it is the science side with a lot of chemistry and physics involved in both the discovery and preservation of artifacts. So for the purposes of our talk today, I'm not trying to bore you with some uh, chemical equations and things like that. Uh, usually in person, I can see when people's eyes start glazing over and I know to kind of like speed up with the chemistry talk and um, uh, you'll have to bear with me today and I'll kind of check in while, with you guys, make sure no one's falling asleep. You know, this isn't your chemistry class test, you're not gonna get graded at the end. Um, but just a, a basic overview of it. Um, so you can kind of understand why we're looking at all of these different shipwreck sites. This is something that a lot of uh, scholars have to know as well, um, not just the history of this shipwreck site that they're looking at, um, but knowing the science to be able to understand what they're seeing. So my background, um, as you could tell by that, that brief little bio is um, kind of diverse for someone talking to you about shipwrecks. Um, my uh, expertise is, is more in the sciences than the, the history side, which doesn't really seem like it would apply to the field of archeology, span my background in astronomy and astrophysics, but it was using particle physics to map archeological sites that I was able to combine my, my interest in uh, history, which I kind of thought of as a hobby at first. Um, before I realized that I could combine these these two passions of mine. Um, in graduate school, I ended up seeing these just massive wooden canoes that were submerged in the lakes of Florida since before the Spanish conquest over 600 years ago. Uh, and I got to uh, apply my chemistry background into the preservation of waterlogged artifacts. So the, the dugout construction of these wooden canoes um, and these boats of the indigenous Americans uh, is vastly different from something like the shipyards of England in the 1700s, but it's that chemistry of preserving the wood that's the same. 
So in simplest terms, when an object that was not designed to be waterproof or water resistant is exposed to water, the object undergoes a chemical reaction. This reaction breaks down the material of the object as it is submerged. Physical and chemical properties of these materials will determine how that object reacts in the water. Now the ocean, as we're all familiar with here on the Cape, uh, is a saltwater environment. This reaction is a lot different from what we see in fresh water because of the different properties and the different compositions of salt water. Now, the main effect that this has on shipwrecked artifacts is that the salt, also known as sodium chloride, is very corrosive to these objects. So what we're looking at here, these big blocks, chloride, sodium, and sulfate, um, as well as calcium there, that little pink block, those are gonna be the most important ingredients in the recipe of, a, of an artifact and how it survives. So uh, now that we've got that, that pretty basic understanding, we can talk about what these elements do to the objects that we find. Now, uh, corrosion, the, the process of oxidation, is really the loss of electrons. For iron, we see oxidation as rust. When rust forms, the electrons move from the atoms of iron to the atoms of oxygen. The salt ions in the salt water help carry these electrons from one atom to the other. And that's what's called electrochemical corrosion. And that's why corrosion of metals happens at a faster rate in ocean water than it does in fresh water. The combination of moisture, oxygen, and salt damages metals more so than just rust. This combination eats away at the metal, causing it to fall apart. This is why many items um, that are made out of iron left in seawater are destroyed over a long period of time. In some saltwater environments, we have organic matter like sea life and corals, um, things like shipworm, uh, that can affect man-made objects that are submerged in the ocean. In shallow waters, where a sunken ship and its artifacts might be exposed to the air every few years, we can even see evidence of barnacles growing on parts of the ship and her artifacts. So far, I've talked mainly about metals and uh, water damage, but with any archaeological site, shipwrecks are full of different material types. Uh, for the purposes of our discussion tonight, I'm not really going to go into materials like fiberglass and plastics, although that is something particularly um, with an ecological conservation side that we should be aware of, in that um, while I'm talking about things like wood and iron that break down over a couple hundred years, you've got plastic that can last thousands of years uh, in the ocean. Um, I have not really conserved anything with, with plastic, uh, or fiberglass, but what we're going to be looking at in terms of our artifacts in these shipwrecks are your more traditional materials like iron, steel, tin, lead, copper, brass, and of course, silver and gold, um, as well as even organic matter that survives like bone, fabrics, and even sometimes uh, things like glass and ceramic pottery. So as I said, I'm really trying not to go over the top with the chemistry for you, um, but in this chart, you can see the common artifact materials archaeologists frequently encounter uh, from the most reactive to the least. So the uh, most reactive aluminum is a, a fairly modern crafting material, not really great for surviving many years in a saltwater environment unless there's any chemical additives, sealants, or coatings applied to it. Uh, one of the least reactive metals in, is gold, which even after thousands of years in the ocean looks brand new when you pull it up. Uh, most commonly, uh, what I worked with in my career was uh, iron damage, which can affect not only the iron object itself, uh, for instance, a, a cannon or even the nails used in the ship construction, uh, but also the other materials that happen to be around it in this wreck. So as we saw, iron is one of these materials that corrodes really quickly in a saltwater environment. As it corrodes, the iron reacts with its surroundings, and it does something uh, pretty unique. So many artifacts that we uncover from the ocean are inside something we call a concretion. So a concretion, kind of like the word concrete, is a hardened aggregate of sand, clay, rock, and seashells, pretty much the, the sediment of the ocean floor. 
Now this forms around man-made objects because of these chemical reactions between the object itself and the salts of the ocean water. Um, you can see in this piece, it's got a, a reddish orange tint and that's how we know, you know, there's, there's an iron piece that caused this to form. Uh, they, they do look like rocks pretty much to the untrained eye. Um, shipwreck divers pretty much know what they're looking for. They also have tools like metal detectors that help them find them. Um, when someone brings something like this up, uh, you can also you know, use an x-ray to see what's inside it. Uh, two of the first underwater archaeologists uh, that are, are names that I think you should know are George Bass and Honor Frost, who took part in the first archaeological expedition to excavate a Bronze Age shipwreck in the 1960s off the coast of Turkey. Now, many such Mediterranean shipwrecks were known by sponge divers, which is really the, the beginning of underwater archaeology, uh, the kind of the first commercial diving enterprises uh, with these sponge divers. But it's really in the 1960s that underwater archaeology becomes kind of this distinct field of study. It, it develops into more of the, the science that we see today, more so than just a, a salvage operation. And we'll look at one of the first discovered shipwrecks in just a little bit. Um, um, Marie, can you know, I stop you for a second? Yeah, sure. We're getting a lot of feedback from your microphone. Okay. Um, I don't know if that could be adjusted slightly. Sure. Let me just play with some settings real quick. Okay, is that a little bit better? I think so, let's give that a try. Okay, and of course one of my dogs just walked in, so I apologize if you now hear some squeaking toys in the background. Um, so underwater archeology span isn't just about shipwrecks. There are other projects that fall under the general underwater domain, like sunken airplanes, um, other things that are not supposed to be found in water. Um, sites that maybe used to be on land, like the harbor of Alexandria in Egypt, um, cenotes, or uh, these deep sacred wells in the Maya cities also fall under underwater archaeology. There's even some salt work remnants here on the Cape uh, that are now either submerged completely or kind of just uh, barely visible at low tides. Uh, but when speaking about shipwreck archaeology, many people will prefer to call it nautical archaeology. I just kind of use the blanket term underwater archaeology uh, when talking about the science side of things. The technology that's been used to locate and observe shipwreck sites has changed drastically since these early sponge divers. Uh, not only do we have GPS grids to map a site, um, but even to find the wreck, we can use things like side scan sonar, magnetometers, tomography, and LIDAR. So similar to the ways that I use particle physics to map archeological sites uh, on land, kind of mapping and scanning underground through walls and chambers to create this digital picture of a site, um, we can use technology to create images and detailed diagrams of an underwater site that uh, may be difficult to approach using some of your more traditional land-based archeology. span And I can tell you from personal experience that uh, placing physical grids underwater, trying to kind of um, tie off your little squares when you've got currents filling in your, your dig pits and moving your grid tape back and forth is, is really not the most ideal situation. So we're, we're quite fortunate now to have all this technology that uh, helps underwater archeology span go. And then of course being, um, well, you guys are, are lucky, those who are uh, in Falmouth to have uh, Woods Hole and all these wonderful marine institutions down there, really at the, the forefront of underwater archeology, span um, technology and engineering. Um, these ROVs, the remote operated vehicles that allow explorers, scientists, and archeologists to, to reach depths that the human body couldn't otherwise survive um, outside of something like a submarine. And of course, I think we can all agree that being in a submarine is really not conducive to kind of digging up things uh, with your hands and being delicate with your, your objects. So um, 
thank you so much to these robots for helping us out. Uh, but also just really the, the advent of scuba gear and remote operated vehicles not only helped us discover shipwrecks, but it helped us reach things that were too heavy and buried too deep under the sand to have brought up before. Um, this was good on the one hand, but on the other hand, the conservation science side of things had to uh, play catch up with it. Uh, sorry. Sorry about that. Um, the conservators were suddenly getting these, these massive things like a, an iron cannon that weighed, you know, 2000 pounds uh, that as it's exposed to the air starts drying out and cracking all of a sudden. And the conservators had to figure out, you know, why is this happening with this when something like these, you know, silver coins that are much lighter that were sitting kind of on the top of the, the ocean floor um, were, you know, totally fine when we brought them up. And it's not really the weight of the object. That really just meant that it was harder to dig up before and it, it hadn't been discovered until then. Um, but it's the, the material, the iron that started uh, cracking and disintegrating without receiving um, some proper care. And really that's because these, um, these challenges of underwater environments that uh, have to have conservators treat artifacts with, with different chemical compounds, different techniques uh, before they can be allowed just back in the, the air again. Now, the, uh, the water and the salt that are absorbed by these artifacts over time need to be gradually removed upon recovery from the sea. And that is this conservation process. Now, artifacts from on land and underwater both go through conservation steps. Um, but usually these stages are very different, uh, not only in what is happening, but how long it's going to take to go through all of that. Um, now, many times, even the, the ships themselves might not be brought out of the water and could be left at the site itself. This could be because of the depth of the wreck, um, if it's really fragile, if it um, had been damaged significantly in the wreck, or even for reverential reasons, uh, such as a burial site for those that may have perished in a wreck. Uh, but upon their removal from the water, an object, whether it's an artifact or parts of the ship, need to be stabilized. Now, many times that means that the objects are kept in water. Now, either seawater or freshwater, depending on the size and transportation requirements. But um, a freshwater submersion means a gradual rinsing out of these corrosive salts that have been absorbed over time. Now, as strange as it may seem to take an object out of the water and then put it back in, um, it's often the best course for submerged materials. Um, so I like to use this metaphor that I think is pretty accessible for, for people of all ages. Uh, I'm sure we've all eaten cereal before, right? Uh, so think of a Cheerio. You've got this uh, solid, crunchy ring shape. Uh, but when the Cheerio soaks up milk, it starts to get mushy. And usually that's when we eat it. Uh, but if we were to take this Cheerio out of the milk and place it on the table, it's going to dry out a little bit, but it's not going to go back into that solid shape that, that it was when it started. Uh, it might completely disintegrate and fall apart. So that's, that's pretty much the same basic essence of stabilizing artifacts by keeping them in the water. As long as they're in that damp environment, the water is preventing the air from oxidizing the artifacts and keeping it from disintegrating. So we call this passive storage. After stabilization, the artifact is visually examined. It might get x-rayed or CT scanned if you can't really see what all might be in there. Um, sometimes in an x-ray materials like glass or, or fabrics don't really show up. Um, there might even be lead blocking uh, smaller objects that are inside. So it's a lot of very meticulous uh, excavation and what we call mechanical cleaning uh, to dig apart these, these pieces here. We'll use chisels, brushes, picks, uh, even sometimes small dental tools. So if you get to see an archaeology lab, you might recognize some familiar tools there. Uh, you know, toothbrushes are great at cleaning little crevices uh, without scratching up artifacts. So chipping away on these uh, hardened pieces that we bring out of the ocean might take anywhere from a few days to a few years, depending on the size, quantity, and the materials of the artifacts themselves. 
Uh, but everything is done very, very meticulously uh, to make sure that the artifacts that we're recovering aren't subjected to any further damage. Sometimes a, um, as an iron artifact, like shackles, nails, or carpentry tools might completely rust away uh, in something like a concretion and give up all of those iron molecules to forming that, that rusty cement blob. Uh, if we're lucky, the iron leaves a void in the concretion, similar to how you would see a, a fossil footprint or, or something like that. Uh, conservators can use these voids as a mold to make a cast out of the artifact that was once there. Um, so what you're seeing this this dark line across the middle, and then you can see another loop, almost like a horseshoe. There was uh, iron inside there that completely rusted away, and we were able to uh, to pour a material in there and make an imprint of it. And so we have like this exact copy of what that artifact used to look like, even though it didn't survive. So once these uh, these artifacts have been cleaned off by hand. We have to go through even more stages, and uh, this is the chemical cleaning process. Um, throughout this, this mechanical cleaning, the objects are still kept in water tanks or misted with water to keep them stable. Um, but during the, uh, the chemical cleaning stage, some metals are subjected to electrolysis, which actually sounds really cool because you get to electrocute artifacts, um, but it's actually, you know, kind of boring to look at, just these little fizzy uh, bits of salt coming off. Um, but what we're doing is uh, applying a low voltage electric current to remove salt, loose rust, and debris. Now this electrical current mimics that process that occurred uh, underwater, this transfer of the electrons. Um, it doesn't really reverse the corrosion, but it does prevent further corrosion from occurring. Nonmetals are either uh, kind of rinsed off of their remaining salt uh, during some freshwater baths or soaked in some chemical cleaning compounds. So just to give you a, a time frame of what we're talking about, something like a, a small silver coin might take 24 to, to 72 hours to get cleaned off. Um, a fully concreted iron cannon through electrolysis might be cleaned off if we're lucky in about 10 years. Now, thankfully, you don't have to just sit there and watch it. You can work on your other projects in the meantime, um, but you just kind of set that up, start sending the electric current through, and, you know, check on it, clean the water every so often. I believe the, the final job of a conservator is to evaluate these pieces uh, and decide how they should be preserved now that they're all cleaned off. Before you can apply this scientific knowledge of, of the chemicals that you might use to preserve it, you have to rely, again, on this historical research. Because if you don't know what your object is, how it was made, what materials it was made out of, you might not know the proper way to treat that artifact. So if I'm looking at a piece of fabric, if I know what time period the shipwreck happened in, you know, where it came from, I might know, okay, is this animal fiber? Is this plant fiber? You know, what is this fabric made out of? And that will tell me how to clean and preserve it. So this is this uh, science and history working hand in hand here. So uh, preservation is really the, uh, the treatment and preparation of an object in its current state to prevent any additional decay and uh, keeping it intact as possible. Sometimes the preservation of an artifact means keeping it uh, as it is without, with any damage that may have happened to it in this wreck. Uh, preservation could also be preparing the artifact if the uh, stability and survivability is dependent on these drastic measures. Uh, some conservators even restore the artifact which means bringing it back to its original appearance. Restoration is often impossible for many shipwrecked artifacts, and uh, many conservators disagree with the concept of uh, restoration of these historical pieces rather than um, just kind of pre uh, preserving them in the state in which they were recovered. A lot of artifact preservation steps involve uh, gradually replacing the absorbed water with other compounds. Um, in the case of something like wood, we use uh, what's called polyethylene glycol. So let me mention the word PEG, and that's kind of the abbreviation for polyethylene glycol. 
Um, depending on the size of your wooden artifact, say the, the wooden plug of a grenade versus the hull of a ship, uh, the conservator will increase the percentage of uh, PEG, the polyethylene glycol, uh, in the solution applied over a series of weeks or years before that artifact is uh, fully saturated. So that's a lot of complex terms that basically mean we're embalming the ship or the pieces of wood. We are replacing this, this uh, kind of organic compound, the water that is in the wood, and we're forcing the water out. But before it can, um, can get all mushy, uh, we are stabilizing it and replacing the space that that water took up with something solid that uh, when it dries out, we'll have something that that does look like a ship. It won't collapse on itself or rot away. Metals are often coated in different compounds to keep them protected from the air after the chemical cleaning stage. So like a chef might have different preferences on how to craft a dish, conservators often have their preferences on how to preserve artifacts. Um, things that I really like to do, you know, are applying tannic acid to iron um, to kind of replace the deteriorated metal. Um, I like to use chemical treatments for rope and cords as opposed to freeze drying or, or waxing the materials, but there are so many different uh, schools of thought and uh, different studies and tests that have been done um, by conservation laboratories, uh, really just finding new and improved ways to clean and preserve artifacts. So now that we've had a, a very long look at the science side, we are going to take a trip around the world and look at a few archeological sites to see how time and mother nature have treated these ships. So some things that I want you to keep in mind uh, at these different sites are water temperature. So colder water and the absence of light means less chemical reactions. Um, fresh water versus salt water means issues of corrosion and often interference by sea life in the form of shipworm and coral growth. So what we really wanna find are ships that have been buried in sediment, either completely buried by sand, mud, or the sea floor, which is gonna prevent this oxidation and deterioration most of all. Now the sites that I wanna start with aren't necessarily shipwrecks per se, nor either are either of them even submerged underwater. So we start in Egypt of all places with the royal ships of Giza and Abydos known as solar barks or ceremonial ships of the gods and pharaohs. So the ships that we're gonna look at are wooden constructions made with cedar. Uh, the, the Khufu ship was found in 1954, buried under sand in a bedrock pit, completely disassembled into 1,224 pieces. So this is what it looked like when archeologists discovered it. All of these meticulously disassembled planks buried in that pit on the left. So after years of reassembly aided by images on ancient Egyptian tombs and temples, as well as the still active boatyards along the Nile and Alexandria, we have one of the world's oldest intact ships dating to roughly 2500 BCE. So it's about uh, 140 feet long and almost 20 feet wide, just for a sense of scale of what that ship is. Uh, but this ship may never have spent time on the water, as archaeologists noted that there weren't any um, evidence of uh, rigging or equipment in place to kind of propel this vessel. Um, but this amazing almost 5,000 year old specimen could still be seaworthy today, as it has been preserved entirely intact where it was buried all these years ago. Um, our next site is also not underwater but certainly a lot closer to the conditions of a nautical discovery. We find our ship buried on land in England in very acidic, damp soil. So this ship was found in the 1930s at a site called Sutton Hoo. And uh, if you were bored last year during the, um, the lockdown, staying, uh, watching a bunch of Netflix, you might have seen a movie called The Dig. And this is the site that they were uh, featuring in that film at Sutton Hoo. Now, among the various mounds and burials here, archaeologists uncovered in mound one, that's the yellow one circled up at the top, the perfect outline of a ship. 
Most of the original oak was completely deteriorated after 1300 years, but what was left was this outline of oak that had stained the soil around it. But these iron rivets, so these tiny little dots that you can see, um, are actually the, the iron still preserved there in its original location. Unlike our Egyptian ships, the Sutton Hoo vessel had actually been used, um, was at sea, and brought up along the nearby river and lowered into this pit on land. Soil analysis determined that when the ship was buried, it contained a single body which had dissolved into the acidic landscape over time. The body would have been surrounded by grave goods, uh, including a distinctive mask, jewelry, bowls, textiles, weaponry, uh, many of which were recovered and preserved, uh, most of which are now on display at the British Museum in London. Now, the difference between the Sutton Hoo ship and the Egyptian ships perspective is very simple. Both were constructed from wood, yet one survived and one did not. The almost 5,000 year old Egyptian vessel was preserved in a dry environment and the 1500 year old ship buried in damp acidic British soil was not. So as promised, we are actually gonna look at ships that did wreck and they are in the ocean. Uh, is actually my favorite shipwreck, if you will permit me such a kind of morbid thing is to have a favorite shipwreck. Um, but this one is found in the Mediterranean Sea off the coast of these uh, southwestern Greek islands. And it is the oldest shipwreck that we're going to look at on our list. It's named after the nearby island of Antikythera. Now, the Antikythera uh, wreck is an early first century BCE Roman shipwreck. It sits in roughly 150 feet of warm water, and the first artifacts were recovered in the year 1900 by Greek sponge divers. Only a few planks of the elm wood of the ship itself were recovered, as well as a few sheets of lead, um, but it's the cargo of the ship that makes this wreck so important. Uh, in addition to some of these ceramics that you can see here, these uh, kind of orange pieces um, buried under the, the sand, they recovered dozens of marble statues as well as several bronze figures. Um, so here are some photos from when I was in Greece a few years ago of uh, statues that were brought up. Uh, these next ones, uh, this is marble. And what's really striking about this is the degradation of the marble. And you can see it uh, where it was exposed to the water as opposed to uh, buried by the sediment of the sea floor. So it kind of makes it look like these figures are carved out of coral or, or volcanic rock, kind of this, this weird line across them. Um, but that's actually because of these chemical reactions happening. Uh, protected the marble and make it made it look um, as smooth as any that were on land for the past few years. So of particular note um, on this shipwreck site is an artifact that's known as the world's first analog computer. Um, scholars are still debating the reconstruction of the 82 known fragments, gears, and other bronze pieces of this device. Um, this kind of computer uh, artifact known as the Antikythera mechanism is thought to have been a celestial clock tracking planetary movements, constellations, eclipses, the moon, and the sun with these 37 gears. It is just absolutely stunning to see. Um, so as, as kind of an uh, astronomical scientist, uh, this probably is the coolest artifact that I think has ever been uh, recovered from a shipwreck site. Um, I also may have been reprimanded a handful of times for getting too close to the case um, at the museum, but that's kind of a rite of passage for any archaeologist and historians is being yelled at uh, in a museum by putting your face too close to the glass. So, um, but no, I did not get kicked out of the museum. Thankfully, I did uh, did get to stay there and spend oh, probably two hours in the uh, the exhibit just looking at. The, the different reconstructions and all the pieces of this artifact. Um, there were other things as well that were recovered, um, including the, the statues that we looked at, ceramic jars, bronze and silver coins, gold jewelry, um, and even human remains. 
Um, DNA was even extracted uh, as recently as 2016 from a newly uncovered human skeleton on this wreck. So I'm actually going to skip over this one here to make sure we have time for questions. Um, but what we're looking at are the ships of the Franklin Expedition, which were preserved in very good condition from the, uh, the very cold waters in which they sank. Um, one of the other sites I wanted to look at is this wonderful thing right here, which doesn't look like much uh, in this little construction site. Um, sometimes the location of the shipwreck stays the same while the environment around it changes. Uh, in this case, what we're looking at is the steamboat Arabia, which struck a sunken tree in the Missouri River in 1856, which tore the vessel apart. Uh, water very quickly filled the hull, and by the next day, only the top of the smokestacks were visible above the mud. Uh, but despite knowing exactly where the ship was, salvage efforts were impossible at that time. Um, today, the Missouri River has actually shifted about half a mile away from what its course was in the 1800s, and the steamboat is buried under a field under about 45 feet of silt and soil. Um, so you can see these irrigation pumps uh, just kind of clearing out, making sure the site's not going to flood while they excavated the steamboat. Um, the end of November in 1988 to kind of mid-February in 1989. So they really only had just a few months to uncover this ship. Uh, the mud of the river preserved an astonishing array of artifacts because the ship was just so completely inundated uh, and remained buried for nearly 200 years. Pretty much all of the cargo and much of the ship itself was completely preserved. So much so that many of the sealed jars of food on board are still edible today. Although that's, that's what I've been told. I do not have first evidence of eating 200 year old shipwrecked food. Um, but here's just a, some of the just absolutely incredibly packed uh, cargo of this ship. Uh, the Arabia was pretty much a traveling store going down the river. And um, you can just see this amazing slice of life, like the, the commercial goods that would have been purchased. So all these uh, carpentry tools, uh, sets of plates and dishware. Um, there's just a whole bunch of doorknobs and tools. And then you can see the, uh, the food uh, there as well. Uh, many of the, um, the work that's been done, the preservation has been done through freeze drying and this, um, the PEG, the polyethylene glycol uh, treatments to preserve what was a freshwater discovery. Food and beverages are preserved with nitrogen and many of the wool clothing and leather shoes were restitched as their cotton threads did not survive, but the, the leather was remarkably intact. Is still ongoing today, and they estimate there's maybe 10 to 12 more years of work on site. Um, it's, of course, impossible to talk about shipwrecks without mentioning the Titanic. Um, I'm not really going to spend too much time going over uh, the history of the ship or the salvage efforts, as I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the story. Um, but what we're looking at here is the Titanic in comparison to our other examples. Now, it sank in 1912 in the very deep and cold waters of the Atlantic, and it rests uh, split into over 12,000 feet below the surface on the ocean floor. Um, parts of it are intact, um, but many of the eternal, internal structures uh, in this bow section, like the staircases and dining rooms, are uh, pretty much like what they used to look like. They haven't collapsed yet, but the, um, the section of the stern is almost completely just shattered and there's a debris field over five miles on the ocean floor that surrounds it. Uh, many of the artifacts and much of the ship itself is subjected to iron eating bacteria more so than they're affected by the chemical reactions uh, that would form something like a concretion as you don't have a lot of uh, calcification happening at the, the depth of uh, where the ship sits, sits like I said uh, 12,000 feet underwater. 
Now these kind of drippy stalactite looking growths are called rusticles, like an icicle, but made out of rust uh, it's caused by uh, the bacteria. Um, in 2019, a, a group called Ocean Gate uh, started imaging the wreck site of the Titanic and constructed some 3D imaging of uh, what the site looked like now, kind of uh, projecting and documenting the deterioration of the site. Um, and unfortunately, the, the scientists estimate that within the next few decades, the corroded hull will likely collapse as a result of um, not only this iron deterioration, but human interference as well um, by the navigation of these submersibles, these um, remote operated vehicles. The conditions of the steel and iron of the Titanic is kind of an indicator of what might happen with our next ship, the USS Arizona. Uh, the Arizona is currently a memorial site in Pearl Harbor, where it was submerged after its attack in 1941. Although much of the ship was dismantled in modern times before the, uh, the site was converted to a memorial, visitors can see the hull and the remains of the turrets, uh, as well as oil, which is that, that oil slick that you see on the top, um, which is known as the Tears of the Arizona constantly seeping out of the hull into the waters of Oahu. Uh, the National Park Service is working with scientists and engineers to monitor and predict the deterioration of this site uh, so they can know if and when they might need to intervene in the, uh, the preservation of the site. Um, okay, I'm going to speed through this next one so we can get into some uh, questions here. But the two shipwrecks we're looking at are uh, much older than the Arizona. We're going back to um, 1628 with the Vasa, which is the ship that we're looking at here, and the Mary Rose, which sank in 1545, as the conservators of these wrecks are among the foremost conservators and uh, scientists in the world. Now, the, uh, the Vasa sank after about 20 minutes. It was on its maiden voyage in Stockholm Harbor. And it is, as you can see, miraculously preserved because of that um, mud that very quickly uh, enrobed it, kind of like the Arabia. Um, much of the material was actually recovered, including these very valuable copper cannons. Um, but those really early salvage techniques kind of destroyed parts of the ship itself, but it still looks absolutely incredible today. Um, the surviving material was raised by digging underneath the ship and lifting it up on straps and with pontoons like this, as it was really just in the middle of the harbor, uh, just totally inconveniently placed in the way where it could get damaged by construction of the harbor, um, other vessels going by, um, not so much the, uh, the chemical environment of the site itself. Uh, very similar was the, the Mary Rose. However, only about 40% of the physical uh, ship itself survives, although they do have quite a few artifacts that were recovered as well. Uh, both of these wooden ships were kept in specialized storage conditions during the conservation efforts, initially sprayed with cold, fresh water while, cons while conservators constructed their excavations. Um, both ships were treated with polyethylene glycol, this kind of embalming of the ships uh, before the drying phases began. Now with the Vasa, you've got some, um, some different conservation concerns. After 17 years of uh, treatments, uh, it did undergo drying and it is now kept in dry storage. But the museum that was constructed in 1990 had this very interesting um, issue happen because they were trying to keep the humidity uh, down in the building, but the levels in the room actually were, were much higher than anticipated because they had so many visitors come to look at it. So just really people breathing around the ship as they visited, the members of the public, um, kind of similar to Egyptian tombs. And they actually rotate uh, 
what days of the week, you know, what times of the year certain tombs are uh, open to the public because they want to uh, limit the amount of exposure to humans that these uh, these artifacts and these remains get. Um, so uh, the last estimates that I saw for the Vasa Museum is they've had over a million visitors uh, that, that come through and look at it because of course it's, it's absolutely incredible. Uh, one of the other issues that they had were the internal and external structural supports. So the, the initial bolts that held the ship together completely corroded. They replaced them in the 1960s and then once again in 2011 with some corrosion resistant steel. So as this technology develops, conservators are able to adapt. Uh, one of the issues that's seen by both the Mary Rose and the Vasa is caused by iron and sulfur in the wood, which causes yellow and white acidic deposits. And that is really from more oxidation, the exposure to oxygen um, and uh, humidity from being underwater. And that's not really something that we have a, a permanent solution for at the time. Uh, on the Mary Rose, conservators have used strontium carbonate to, to treat it, as well as experimenting with nanoparticles to remove the sulfuric acid buildup. Um, so like all, all of these different things that you learn as the conservation process continues. And they're among the, the most ambitious conservation efforts in maritime archeology. span So I, I hope you've been entertained by our journey today through the world of uh, shipwrecks. And each one of these wreck sites, uh, as well as so many more could be a, a single topic of discussion on their own. And I would definitely suggest researching more about any of these ships, particularly if you're interested in the construction of the vessels um, and the history of the, the discovery of them. Uh, the, the first time I really gave this talk was um, quite a few years ago for a, a boat building convention, which I thought was, was rather amusing that boat builders wanted me to talk about how their ships would deteriorate over time. Um, so I had this kind of uh, witty bit of advice for them that I will leave you with today before we move on to our uh, question and answers. And so I told them my, my advice was if you're looking for a boat that will last forever for future archaeologists to find and, uh, and just have in perfect condition, build your ships entirely out of gold. Um, I mean, it'll be really expensive and really impractical, um, also extremely heavy to have a, a ship made out of gold, but whatever environment your ship ends up in after thousands of years, it's still going to look brand new. Um, so thank you so much for uh, going through these wrecks with me. I know we are getting a little bit close to eight o'clock, um, but I'm happy to take some questions and uh, please feel free to type them in the chat or you can use the reactions to kind of raise your hand and uh, we can unmute you to ask your question. All right, um, Carolyn. Good evening, everyone. Hello, Marie, how are you? I'm good, Carolyn, it's so nice to see you. <laughs> same, same. Let me congratulate you again on another wonderful presentation, terrific job. Um, I wanted to ask you about schooling for archeology span and as a person who's gone through the paces to get to the place where you are now with your knowledge bank, can you give younger people who are considering their schooling some advice on how you would pursue a career in archaeology? Sure. That's a great question, Carolyn. Thank you. Um, so I actually never really did formal coursework and study in uh, maritime or underwater archaeology. And some of the people that I worked with uh, never really went to school for underwater archaeology at all. Um, but it's these different skills that we picked up uh, through what we were in school for that allowed us to, to work on these different rec sites. Um, so my undergraduate work, I, even though I grew up on the Cape, I went to school in Florida, did my undergraduate school at Florida Institute of Technology in Melbourne, which is uh, part of, it's called the Space Coast, but just a little bit further south is the Treasure Coast. And that's where there are so many uh, Spanish shipwreck sites. So between being here on the Cape, you know, all these New England shipwrecks, uh, being in Florida with all these shipwrecks, it was always something that I was aware of. 
Um, I did a lot of physics, a lot of particle physics in undergraduate, as well as these uh, hands-on chemistry labs just uh, for my degree. But my hobby from going back to, I don't know, pretty much elementary school was um, visiting museums, visiting libraries. Um, I'd go to my school library. I would go to, you know, the public libraries here and just read books on whatever seemed interesting to me. So I, I had read a lot about the Titanic, um, which I thought was just really cool, you know, really awesome. I'm pretty sure I had a Titanic themed birthday party when I was like eight years old. So, you know, thanks mom and dad <laughs> uh, for supporting that. But, uh, you know, the Museum of Science and just really learning more on my own what I was interested in so that I could ask people questions and, um, just learn what things existed. So one of the reasons why I really like doing these programs is to kind of introduce topics that that people might not know exist. You know, I'm I'm really not a diver. I don't enjoy diving here um, in the Atlantic Ocean, which is cold and murky and horrible and full of sharks that think I'm a baby seal. Um, Mediterranean was beautiful, the Caribbean was nice, but you know, my expertise, like I said, with the science background is pretty much to sit in the laboratory. You know, you don't have to have some perfect skill set to be able to, to work on a project. Um, when I went to grad school, pretty much everyone I was with in the archaeology and the, the history world, uh, a lot of them were studying painting and Renaissance art. And I'm looking at dirt and soil composition. And uh, I'm like, well, that looks boring. And they're like, you're looking at dirt, but okay, sure. Um, whatever makes you happy. And we had people that came and did a, a presentation from the State Department in Florida, um, the Bureau of Archaeological Research. And I ended up being an, an intern with them for uh, one year when I was in grad school. I was taking photos of artifacts and happened to come across, like I said, these, these massive wooden canoes submerged in tanks. And I went, oh, hey, you know, is this electrolysis? And they're like, yes, but what do you know about electrolysis? Aren't you one of these, you know, art history people? And I'm like, well, actually, you know, we did electrolysis to um, electroplate uh, computer chips and things like that. And so then they said, whatever you're doing is not important anymore. Come learn and walk through the laboratory with us. And it was just really being in the right place and asking people questions going, hey, wow, that seems really interesting. Can you tell me about what you're working on? And um, when I was at the, um, the Pirate Museum, which is where I met Carolyn, um, that was pretty much the best part of what I got to do was having a lab space where people of all ages could come up and just ask me questions about what I was working on. So um, hopefully, I, I know I've inspired a few people because I still get letters from them, which is fantastic um, to see, you know, even a, a few years later, some people that I maybe went to their high school are now in college and they're studying things going, well, I really like this when when I heard about it from you and I thought I was going to study shipwrecks. But then when I studied shipwrecks, I found out about, you know, this field and now this is what I'm doing. I'm like, that's awesome. That's, you know, that's exactly what happened to me. So um, don't be afraid to ask questions of people and definitely spend so much time in libraries and talk to your librarians, ask them, you know, hey, I thought this book was cool. Can you recommend more books about this? And they will totally help you out. Great advice, thank you. All right, looks like we've got some, some divers and, and other people who have visited, visited museums. Oh, the ones in Kansas City, yes. I have not seen that one, the Arabella, um, but yeah, if you get a chance, I, the, the Arabia Museum, oh my gosh, just, that's astonishing how many things that they have. I'm like so jealous uh, none of the sites that I work with had you know nearly half as many things as that one so just absolutely really really cool okay yes um, so I don't know too much about the Sparrowhawk. Um, so this one's in the chat. Um, the Sparrowhawk is, Sparrowhawk is the oldest surviving shipwreck 
from uh, 1626. Much of its frame is currently in Plymouth. Can you say anything about why so much of this ship survived? I believe that the the Sparrow Hawk, I, I don't think it broke up too much when it sank and um, it was covered up by the Atlantic Ocean. And I know a lot of the, um, the, the very cold waters of it, um, while the, the currents are, are very strong, if it was completely covered up, pretty much the, the levels of sand on top might shift a little bit, but I don't think the ship itself uh, was impacted too much with the um, kind of shifting the, the frame of the ship. I know that's probably not like a, a great answer there, but um, really not, not too much interference from, from other either natural elements or uh, human elements as well. Um, and I wish I knew when it was uh, discovered uh, that I definitely, like this is the best part of, of when I do presentations is there's always someone who, who mentions a ship that I don't know too much about. And so now I have my research cut out for me. So I'm gonna you know, start looking up some, some stuff about the Sparrowhawk. So the next time someone's asked me, I can, uh, I can go, oh, thank you, Lauren, for looking it up, uh, May, 1863. Okay, so yeah, over over 200 years where it was probably just completely uh, covered and, and protected, uh, which definitely helped. Uh, some of these sites in the Mediterranean, uh, you don't have the, the ship itself anymore because it, I mean, everyone knew where they were and they were just stealing things off of it, you know, salvaging, but mostly just going, oh, this is free real estate, um, having uh, just easy access and, and things being in shipping routes. Um, I think there's there's maybe 3000 shipwrecks off the coast of the Cape and some of them you find on top of each other, uh, different materials from different time periods, um, just kind of stacked up because there's only you know so many ways you can get around or, or get through the Cape. So um, you'll find a lot of other locations where the ship is is completely off course, um, like with the Franklin ships that we didn't get to to really cover tonight. Um, they're almost completely intact. They didn't wreck. They got stuck in the ice and then just gradually sank down. Um, nothing else really went over them, went through them uh, to to crush them uh, too much. In Rhode Island, we have a German U-boat sunk in 1945. How long is it likely to last above the sand? Um, so I urge you to check out a ship called the Hunley, H-U-N-L-E-Y. And that is pretty much gonna be your perfect model for um, what will happen to, to that ship. Um, it was full of sand, which kept it preserved, but they still keep it in tanks. Um, so if it's if it's above the sand, um, it's not being protected. Yes, it's it's in water, but ideally, um, I would recommend getting the the boat out of the water and into a a conservation tank. Um, start doing freshwater rinses, that sort of thing. I don't know. Um, depending on where it is, if it is a protected land, if it's, um, I know some of these are like national uh, protected sites, either because of it's a uh, memorial site or just uh, historically significant and people aren't allowed to, to interact with it. So um, I'm gonna see, that's another one. See, I love looking up all these questions and going, oh, I wonder who, uh, who owns this shipwreck and if they need any conservation help. You know, maybe not Rhode Island, but if someone exotic, maybe out in Oahu needs some help, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to go visit and provide some expertise. Maybe not so much. Um, all right. So it's a little bit after eight o'clock. Um, what, what do you think? Should we show them the... Uh... Yes, I think that would be fantastic. Okay, let me pull it up. So I've got a special surprise for you guys. Um, the object that I'm gonna show you, Carolyn, I think you have seen this in person. So you might recognize what we're talking about. Um, enjoy. All right.
this very exciting object. Wow. This is an x-ray of something that was discovered um, off of the, uh, the Witta Galley, which sank off the coast of Wellfleet in 1717. Um, and this was brought up by divers in 2017. Uh, it was underwater for 300 years. When we took an x-ray of the concretion, um, it was this big giant blob. And um, you can tell through this circle, you can kind of see an arc there. And I went, oh, okay, cool. This is, um, this is gonna be a cannonball. You know, typical kind of straightforward thing, uh, which really appealed to me because I had just finished up a project uh, pulverizing already excavated debris. Um, into like little dust shot and gold pieces. So I was like magnifying glasses on, like bright light shining down with my dental picks. And I'm like, awesome, a cannonball. I'll have this knocked out in about three hours. We can put it in electrolysis. Awesome. Yeah, that, um, that, that didn't quite work out. <laughs> After the, the first two hours, um, I took all of this, uh, the sand and rock away from it to get down to the core of the piece. And then I noticed some string. I'm like, okay, you know, not, not too strange. Maybe it's a, a hand grenade um, and not a cannonball. So, you know, typical archaeology job. Oh, you know, just, you know, normal day found a hand grenade. It happens. Um, but I have to, uh, to change up my excavation plan a little bit just to, to make sure we didn't damage the wood and any other uh, cordage that might be part of this. Um, but it wasn't just a little bit of string. Uh, it, uh, it was not not a hand grenade. And it looked like that when I was done excavating. Uh, the rest of the excavation took weeks of meticulous chipping and picking away to keep the cords in, in pretty much this perfect condition that they were found in. Um, the cords themselves were a plant-based fiber wrapped around an iron cannonball. So it's not, you know, a hollow grenade. This was a solid, uh, uh, I was about a, I think it was a five pound, five pounder here, um, if memory serves. This was, like I said, 2017, so it was a few years ago. Um, so in order to keep these cords in their knotted pattern, I had to create a mold uh, to then put the strings back around. So I had to separate the, the cords from the iron because in order to clean the iron, um, kind of debris out of the cords, it, they needed to not be attached to this iron cannonball or else the cannonball would get destroyed. In order to clean off the cannonball, the cords had to be out of the way. So um, we had this fun little thing, um, this crucified chopstick and, uh, you know, little MacGyvering here with rubber bands and, um, and the foam, kind of like what you'd see in like a Pelican case, so these, um, material that wasn't going to get uh, destroyed through the conservation and cleaning chemicals that I would have to apply to it. Um, and I wanted to make sure that the cords themselves weren't going to shrink um, and still be malleable. So they couldn't be freeze dried, they couldn't be brittle um, to then reassemble them back on the iron cannonball. Um, the cannonball actually was just you know, straightforward. Once I finally got it out, you know, just electrolysis uh, for about eight weeks, chemical bath for another few weeks, um, dried, stabilized, coated in uh, a layer of wax. Meanwhile, these darn cords, um, parts of it, uh, you can see those, those little chunks on the front. Um, that was concretion that I just couldn't pull apart without damaging the knots. And um, it, uh, it took 10 months to uh, clean, to excavate, uh, chemically clean, and then preserve these pieces. Um, and this is what it looked like when I was done. And um, yeah, this is probably my favorite artifact I've ever worked with uh, personally. Um, so the question that I get now is, okay, so what is it? We have no idea what it, what it is. There were so many different theories that came up. Uh, we showed it to different maritime historians, uh, historical reenactors, you know, current sailors. That the closest answer that, that seemed to make sense was um, that it was a, a weight of some kind. It, it wouldn't have been 
you know, like a bar shot out of a cannon. Um, these ropes are really thin and it wasn't um, uniform enough to get stuffed inside a, a cannon and shot out. Um, it wouldn't have been lit on fire as a flail and kind of like whipped around. Um, it wasn't a sounding weight. They were smart enough to know that the iron would corrode. So their sounding weights were made out of lead. Um, possibly it was something like a like a monkey's fist even like this knotted up weight at the bottom of a rope or even a, a counterweight on the ship um, like to, to lift a, a hatch open and, and prevent it from slamming back down again. Um, you know, I've worked enough with a lot of scouts that if you leave a, a group of scouts alone for 10 minutes, the next thing you know, any bits of rope are going to be tied up into knots. So maybe someone was just bored and wanted to practice their knot tying. Um, this whole thing is, is completely knotted up. If you've seen like a, a witch's ball or a fisherman float, you know, Christmas tree shop has them all the time, those little glass balls. Um, they were mocking me that summer that we, we found this, just seeing these little glass balls with the netting around it. And I'm like, yep, I'm working on it. Okay, <laughs> I'm trying. Um, but yeah, probably because of the, the unknown, the sense of mystery, uh, it was so intriguing, but it was also just, it was just a really fun challenge to, uh, discover and kind of research brand new techniques to be able to preserve it. So, so no one had really done um, together what, what I did for this different, um, I use different manuals. Um, Texas A&M has a great manual of uh, conservation of different materials uh, using some of their efforts, some of these scientific studies of um, preserving rope and cord and then deciding, okay, I wanna use these chemicals. You know, I called up, um, I think the, the foam manufacturer and said, hey, I have a question. Will this deteriorate if this material is applied to it for seven months? And they said, I'm not sure. I'm going to put you on hold. And they got me in touch with their project scientist who said, so here's what we did. We took a piece of it and we soaked it and then we burned it in the oven to like speed up that uh, that chemical process. Like they didn't burn it, but they cooked it a little bit. Um, and they said, it's totally fine. It hasn't uh, changed size or shape. It's still solid. You should be good to go, but please tell me what you're working on and send me photos because this is the coolest assignment I've had. So um, yeah, it was fun. I had a little bit of collaboration, but so much innovation here on this um, beautiful little, uh, cannonball here. So uh, I'm not really sure where it is on display right now. Um, I think it was brought up to, to Provincetown, but I know they don't use that museum anymore. I think Atlantic White Shark has it now. Um, the museum, not the, the cannonball here. Um, but just a, I have so many photos of all the stages. I think I have close to a thousand photos of the conservation process, the excavation and, and the preservation. So this is my, my special treat for you guys tonight is is really it's my favorite artifact that we have here and it looks like there's definitely a ton of stuff in the chat and um i see some hands raised um and i cannot seem to stop sharing my screen so bear with me so i can close the window okay here we go yep sounding stone mm -hmm. yep a way at the end of a net yep monkey's fist Awesome. So, Kevin, it looks like you have your hand raised. I'm going to go ahead and ask you to unmute to ask your question. So the question I had was, how long do you think a German U-boat would be able to last underwater? OK. Um, yeah, so uh, that's when it's not it's not buried by the sand, right? It's not covered up. It's just kind of sitting on the ocean floor underwater. Oh, I mean, I guess it depends the situation, like like how it sank or if it's just sitting there. Um, yeah, so. I mean, that's that's kind of a big thing. What, what we wanna see in terms of making sure something is preserved underwater is whether the, the sediment, the sand from the ocean floor has um, covered it up. And um, I, I'd have to take a look and, and see or just find out more about the, the wreck site and, um, and kind of how it sank. 
if there's water and debris inside um, versus just on the exterior. Um, there is a ship called the Hunley, H-U-N-L-E-Y. Um, look that one up and see how similar it is to the um, to the U-boat that you're talking about. And um, that project, they actually took it out of the ocean and started conserving it. And um, uh, that would kind of be your ideal scenario is having that whole intact ship. All right, thank you. You're very welcome. Oh, sorry, that's my dog. I've had all three of my dogs in the room with me today. So I apologize if you've heard some kind of wrestling and squeaky noises um, while I was talking. <laughs> they always wanna be in the room while I'm giving a presentation. So they seem to really like the shipwreck one, uh, not so much the um, pyramids and aliens one. They're like, no, nope, bored, heard this one a few times. So I've got, I've only got one left in here. So hopefully you all are still awake and, and were kept entertained as well. Very much so. Marie, first, thank you for sharing that uh, object with us at the very end. That was incredible. And I um, had a question for you that you answered. What was your favorite or most interesting thing that you worked with? And so thank you very much for sharing with that, um, that with us. And thank you so much for doing this lecture. It was very fascinating, very interesting, and greatly appreciated. Well, thank you so much for inviting me, and um, I look forward to to talking more about archaeology with your um, your constituents here. At the uh, it looks like we had a lot of people, not just in Falmouth, so that's kind of the the silver lining of these virtual programs um, is getting to reach all these people who I might not normally get to to talk to. That's right. Yes. So, and everyone, thank you for joining us tonight for this awesome lecture. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, and so with that, we're going to call it a night. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for coming. Marie, once again, thank you for this amazing lecture. We, it was fantastic. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Everyone have a wonderful evening.